Eileen, Cloud Op Advocate at Microsoft. Um, we're doing a power hour today, and uh, Sarah will be giving her presentation about uh, server nuts to beyond in the cloud. Um, so uh, I'm John Janelle. I'm the Associate Director and Principal IT Architect at Western Washington University, James Petty. Hey, yeah, guys. So uh, I'm James, the President and CEO of the DevOps Collective, and uh, I think this is week number 20 for us. I think episode 10 or 11 or something like that. Yeah, so we're excited to have you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me. It's fun to be here. Yeah. Now, obviously, for those watching it, for those watching at home, uh, Sarah has kind of an accent. Sarah, where are you from? Um, I'm from just outside Glasgow in Scotland. Awesome. I think we had uh, we had Josh King with us last week. He was from the other mm -hmm. side of the world, over New Zealand. So that was a lot of fun. Multinational. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we try. We're doing, our, doing our best. Um, All right. So, uh, so, yeah, so Sarah, so what are you going to talk to us about? about my career journey from um, like John said from pushing server cage nuts to actually pushing code um, in this new cloud world that we all um, can operate in it and <laughs> well, all right well um, I guess we don't have any questions for those of you watching at home if you got any questions feel free to put them in the twitch chat oh, or if you're in social events and the PowerShell slack and or discord uh, you can put them there's uh, put that together as well if not, we'll uh, turn it over to Sarah here. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yes, today's presentation is about pushing server cage nuts to pushing code. So let's start off with my career and where I started. So I um, went to university and got a computing degree and then I moved into my first role um, and that was in a first level help desk role and that was um, like you, you probably know first level help desks that is answering the phone and dealing with people resetting passwords and all of those kind of fun things. And yes, I have had that phone call where someone said, um, my monitor isn't working. And after a few questions, I realized what they were actually trying to tell me was that the power in the building wasn't working that morning. And that's why it wasn't working. So um, yeah, I had all of that fun. And um, it definitely actually was fun, to be honest. I know I sound quite trite there, but it was a fun experience because I learned how to interact with customers. I learned how to um, triage their issues um, over the phone because when I did this, there was no things like video um, calls built into your PC. There was no webcams. It was all through phone calls and some of it maybe was through email. Um, so you definitely had to learn your communication skills, your customer service skills in order to translate all of the technical wording that I had and all of my technical knowledge into something that the other, the end user would understand. Um, and again, without being um, disrespectful, the, the people on the other end of the phone didn't have the same technical experience as me. So saying something even just as simple as a taskbar to them might not have made, made anything to them. So I had to really understand and use my language and use my words to help them fix that problem and try and diagnose it as well. So I spent several years doing that, learning my trade on the help desk. And I also moved into second level roles, which saw me moving away from um, being stuck on the telephone and actually being able to go out to customers and actually speak to them at their desks. And that was a lot of fun as well. Um, I did um, you know, have to deal with printers and print or jams and toners exploding on me and um, so there was a different level of fun when I moved to that second level role um, and I think this picture of you know um, have you tried turning it off and on was very much true in that area of my career but it was great fun and it did teach me a lot what I learned as well is that there's a lot of variety of different technologies um, on board and um, on your screen you'll see things like Exchange Server, we've got Windows Server 2008, Windows 7, um, Active Directory, printers, all of those are core services and if we think about it today those, those core services are still existing. Yes we shouldn't be using Server 2008 anymore, hopefully no one's using that anymore even though it's end of life, but we still use servers right and Server 2016 or 2019 that, that core technology is still very much there so what I learned there um, is still very much relevant today. And again, operating system has changed. Windows 7, um, again, we hopefully aren't using that anymore, um, but it's still still a core thing that we need to interact with, whether it be a Windows operating system or a Mac OS, we're still using those operating systems. So 
the variety that I got um, when I was in these first and second level roles really helped me understand um, my whole career. They really built that that solid platform of where I um, started off with and moved forward with. And it was great fun, right? Like I said, paper jams, toners exploding, um, electricity faults happening and people phoning up the help, IT help desk ex expecting them to fix them as well. Um, but after cutting my teeth in those first and second level type roles, I moved on to being a third level support engineer or a consultant. And that saw me move into the realms of fixing the really big problems um, that were happening, having to really deal with some outages within the organization or even actually designing solutions for the customers. And I worked in various different roles, er, sorry, companies for this. So sometimes I was working within a larger organization who had just had an IT department. And then sometimes I was working for managed service providers who were providing support to other customers. And that was another um, transition for me as well, working in a managed service provider, because no longer did I have that rapport of maybe seeing the people I was speaking to the, on the phone, walking through the lunch hall. I would never get to meet some of these people that I was supporting and designing solutions for so again hopefully all my customer service skills that I'd learned at my first and second level roles really played through and helped me build up those relationships and build up that trust for um, the consultancy role and the managed service provider as well but I also was able to pull on all of those things that I learned from those earlier roles and when I was designing solutions and systems I was able to take in some of the things that were pain points even just for me so things like naming conventions that were completely off and wrong, um, how to deploy a server, where things had to be, how you had to separate the roles on servers and just make things a little bit better and a little bit easier as well. Even things like role access as well. So making sure that help desk people had access to them at some of these servers, but not full admin access so that they could accidentally do something but they could actually help us in our role and not have to pass so many faults along the chain as well so lots of things were learned and hopefully um, put into um, that third level and that consultancy kind of architecture role as well now I spent a lot of time in server rooms. That is absolutely where I was now. These are none of my pictures. I found these online because I can't find all of the, the horrible pictures that I took of some of the data centers that I spent time in. But I did spend a lot of time in these data centers in these hot, cold, aisle type um, data centers. I also spent um, time working for a whiskey company here in Scotland. And one of their buildings was actually an old farmhouse. So yes, I have sat on old concrete in this really cold building trying to fix phone faults as well so plethora of opportunities to work in that data center and hardware really was something that I enjoyed and I could name off um, you know what an HP server or a Dell server if you gave me the number or the you know the, the, the type of server that was and what we could actually do with that I could tell you you could put so many gig of RAM in it or this server wasn't great because of the speed of the hardware I knew all of that off by heart I was a proper geek when it came to some of that stuff but after a while, to be honest, I was starting to realize that that wasn't the way forward for IT. You know, three or four years ago, maybe even five or six, if we think about it, actually going back now, I was starting to see a transition. People were actually starting to talk about things like um, Office 365 and moving even just their email away from being an on-prem solution to something in the cloud. And that's when I started to think that maybe I needed to change my direction or upskill and add something to my career. And that's when I started to think about um, changing my job roles um, because the jobs I was in were fully focused on on-prem solutions. So I took a leap of faith in 2017 and joined this really small company here in Glasgow who were fully focused on the cloud. All they did was implement cloud solutions either in Office 365 or Microsoft 365 as we refer to it today and some Azure things as well. Now they already had an engineer in their company but he was a born in the cloud engineer. He'd never felt the pain of having to deal with server 2008. He'd never looked at Windows Server. He'd never dealt with a physical server if all be told. So I was really coming on board to help him um, that transition and being able to translate what our customers had into what we were going to try and uh, put it into in terms of um, Microsoft 365 or Azure solutions as well. So we were really working together in tandem um, and sharing our knowledge and designing solutions going forward as well. 
Now, as I said, the first thing that I actually did within the cloud was an Office 365 or a Microsoft 365 move. And I think probably speaking to some of my colleagues, that's probably where most of us have actually started with the cloud solutions, moving that Exchange server um, from Exchange 2007, Exchange 2010, whatever it may be, up into um, Office 365 and just moving that one workload. Now, there's a lot more to Office 365 than email. Um, and that's where we started to actually leverage some of um, the business value or the value add that you can have around 365, getting people to implement Office 365, uh, sorry, SharePoint, getting them to look at OneDrive for shared files and just being able to com communicate and collaborate a bit better using some of the technology that they had now available to them now that email was being moved up into there. So, yeah, that was the first thing I ever did in a cloud and that was moving um, people to 365 um, and hopefully um, driving the adoption of how to use some of the collaboration tools. Now, the first ever Azure topic or project that I worked on was an IoT project. Now, I'll be entirely honest. See, when this project came across my desk, I didn't even know what IoT stood for. I was like, oh, my God, what is this? Why is my boss giving us this? And this is completely out of my comfort zone and I'm going to fail completely and I'm going to have to give up IT forever and go and look somewhere else and, and do something else completely different. However, I kind of gave myself a little shake and realized that this was an opportunity to try and learn something new and actually work in the cloud and do something a bit outside of my comfort zone. So what we had had in this project was a customer who had to measure the temperature of a fridge on their um, office space and then be able to report on that. So be able to tell someone um, if they were audited, what temperature that was and how long it was and, and all those kind of things that go around being audited for your fridge temperatures. The solution they had was all on prep it was really unreliable it constantly needed a restart from the IT department they had to go and kick the server every now and again to make it work the end users that were actually dealing with the fridge and the components within the fridge um, couldn't access the data so they had to log a help desk ticket with their IT team to get in that data which was really cumbersome again so if they were being audited they had to log a ticket and then wait for the help desk to get round to actually getting them the data back. So it was a horrible solution for them, even though it was a solution. So what we did was install um, IoT sensors into the fridge. We then used IoT Hub on Azure. We used Stream Analytics. We used Cosmos DB and a bit of Power BI to try and pull all of that data, store it all and make it be um, visualized um, for the end users as well. There was lots of lots of sleepless nights and trying to figure out how all of this worked. Um, because like I said, I'd never done IoT before and never used something like Cosmos DB before, completely different from any of the relational relational databases that I'm used to. So my SQL queries were all out the window. Um and again, a lot of this technology back maybe even in 2007, 2000. 2017 sorry in 2018 was brand new so there was not a lot of documentation and even the documentation gave you just the bare minimum that you needed to get started with so like I said there was lots of sleepless nights and lots of late nights trying to get this solution working but I'm pleased to say that we actually did get a solution up and working for the customer so hopefully I think they're still using it today but it was really a learning curve for me in order to understand that Yes, I could actually figure out um, some of this cloud stuff and I wasn't um, completely out of my depth and I could actually move forward with my IT career. Now, the second project that I ever worked on in Azure was something a little closer to home and something that we're probably all implementing in some shape or form across our IT departments. And that's a backup and disaster recovery project. Um, and this was a lot easier. And I kind of wish that this had been my first um, project within Azure. But it was really, again, upgrading a customer who had an on-prem backup solution. So they had um, their headquarters here in the UK and they had offices in Dubai and they had offices in Asia as well now all the IT department was based here in the UK so they were absolutely fine they were changing the backup tapes they were maintaining it they had a company to take the off-site tapes all of that was absolutely fine but the issue was in Dubai and in Asia they didn't have a dedicated IT person so they were really relying on someone in the office to be able to manage those tapes and tapes were going missing tapes were getting broken tapes were getting left in people's handbags or at homes so it really wasn't a reliable situation that they were in so they wanted something that we could actually operate from the UK so the IT department here in the UK could control it but they also had obviously that peace of mind with backup in place and that's where we introduced um, Azure backup for them and that worked fine and 
let, let's face it, any backup technology is pretty much the same regardless of who makes it. Um, you point it at your workload, you back it up um, every night, you back it up every seven days, every 30 days and every year, right? That's the kind of solution that you can use. So that wasn't daunting at all to me. Yes, I had to learn some new things and how to point things where and, and figure, figure out things like Azure data centers and Azure regions and costing and retention policies and all of that. But we were able to implement that now, the second part of that project was actually putting disaster recovery in place. And again, they didn't have anything reliable. So we looked at Azure Site Recovery. Now, we might managed to get Azure Site Recovery working in the UK for our customers. But at the time, because there wasn't any um, Azure regions in Dubai or Asia that could really meet our um, kind of latency issues that we had and um, data residency issues as well we didn't get it implemented there and um, now when you probably look at the Azure data centers we have one in Dubai and we have some in Asia more as well so you could probably go back and revisit that and I hope that the customer is actually going back and revisiting that and implementing it as well but again it was another familiar topic and tool to me because again disaster recovery is all about being able to um recover from a disaster. Um, so you have to have um, your major systems backed up or protected and then a methodology for bringing that back up in a plan. So again, I was more confident actually working on this project and working forward. And again, it reiterated to me that I could take all the skills that I had and actually implement them in the cloud. They were still very much relevant, even though I was learning new interfaces, I was still able to actually, you know, um, take those skills that I'd, I'd learned as well. So again, another great project for me to cut my teeth on. As I said, in this role, the person that I was working with um, was a born in the cloud engineer. He'd never touched um, hardware on prem. So we were both helping to mentor each other. So um, often, like I said, when the, when we're doing those Office 365 migrations, I was able to um, relate to some of the on-prem technology, the exchange technology, the servers, the hardwares, the weird stuff that customers had implemented to make their printers work through their email system. All of that, I was able to help translate into the cloud and he was able to help me figure out some of the cloud terminology. So we were basically mentoring each other and then being the mentee as well. So that was a great um, transition for us. And I think that's something to remember that we can learn something from each other regardless of how many years we've been in the IT industry or what our, what our speciality, uh, speciality is as well. Now this actually led me on to forming the Glasgow Azure user group. Um, I wanted to learn more about the cloud and I needed to um, bounce some ideas off more people than just my colleague in, in the office. Um, but there wasn't a user group um, in Scotland. The only user group at the time for Azure was in London. And Glasgow and London are not commutable. I think it's about 500 miles. So it definitely wasn't going to be something I was going to be attending regularly. So that's when I started up the Glasgow Azure user group. And it's been a great ride. Um, to be honest, it's taught me a lot. It's taught me about how to publicly speak. It's taught me about things like Photoshop, designing logos, building websites again. There's have been a ton of things that has taught me. It's also helped me, um, you know, meet new people, get new friendships, get new network connections, hear lots of new things and technologies that some of our speakers come and people in the audience talk about as well. So if you haven't um, attended an Azure user group, and I know it's maybe a little bit harder now with the current situation, um, but there's a list online of the user groups that are operating around the world. So you should be able to find one that's in your region that's hopefully operating virtually and you can still attend because these community events are massively impactful and they have been for me as well. Now, operating in the cloud requires you to start to look at um, coding. Um, and as an infrastructure person who is dyed in the wool hardware person, I loved GUIs and that was exactly where I'd spent all my time. I used a little bit of PowerShell because um, I think it was Exchange 2007, Microsoft took away some of the interface um, and you had to do things within PowerShell. So I dabbled in it a bit. I had some scripts. I had a bit of knowledge. Um, I was sometimes that person who would take a PowerShell script off the internet and run it in production environments because, you know, who 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 doesn't do that? But um, when we started to actually um, look at Azure and started to look at Office 365, things were starting to get a bit more code heavy. And I started to look at how to use um, PowerShell to do automated deployments, how to deploy ARM templates. Um, and then there was also obviously the bash, so Azure CLI. 
Now, again, this is great where my colleague and I kind of worked together and taught each other a bit because he'd never used PowerShell and he was a bash person. Um, and again, we were able to kind of have little competitions every now and again where I would sit down and try and automate something as a PowerShell script and he would try and do it in a bash script. Um, and back then there was massive disparities between the two languages and you could do some things in PowerShell that you couldn't do in the CLI and vice versa so we really taught each other a lot about that and to be honest I think I actually prefer CLI nowadays um, to doing some things it seems a bit quicker and it seems a bit more intuitive so yeah that I have had to go into the coding world I'm still not an expert but I know how to dabble in it and I don't think there's a day where I don't fire up Visual Studio Code um, to write a bit of code or to try something out or execute something on Azure. So, um, yeah, you, unfortunately, um, for those people who are infrastructure people and love GUIs like me, you're going to have to learn a bit of coding um, when you're working in the cloud. And that's just the way it is, unfortunately. But it's also led me into automation. And again, DevOps isn't something I thought I would ever deal with. It's not something I ever thought I would have to deal with. Um, I always put it down as a developer only type tool or, a, or methodology and not something I would have to look at. And now my blog is all DevOps. So I write my blog in YAML in Visual Studio Code. I push it up into my repository in DevOps. Um, there's some testing that happens out to make sure I've not completely um, broken the code before it gets deployed out. It gets deployed out to a test web app and then gets deployed out to the production one. So um, I've got automation in place for even just my web blog. Um, so it's something that, again, I'm not massively expertised in, but I can dabble in it and I understand the technologies. I understand what an Azure board is within Azure DevOps. I understand pipelines and releases. And again, not my specialty area, but I understand the concepts and can talk a bit about it. And I can also um, relay those conversations between customers to my colleagues who are more experienced in DevOps. But again, automation is a big thing that we're going to have to go into. And let's face it, automation saves us from doing those mundane tasks that we all hate doing um, and allows us to actually get into using some of the cooler stuff that are now is available within the cloud. Now, another thing I didn't think I was going to have to figure out was Git. I, again, thought this was a developer technology. Didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, no, all my code is stored in a Word document or on my OneDrive or on a USB. I don't need to know this language Git. I don't need to know it. Um, I now tell you that I now write blogs about Git because it's something that I use on a daily basis. Um, and it's been really useful Again, I'm not an expert. I often have to look up a search engine for some of the commands or go into the help of the command to find the right one. But again, it's something that I now use. And I think we all have to be able to use a little bit of it and understand the benefits of it, understand the disadvantages of it as well. But Git is a way of being able to interact with things like GitHub. And again, I was writing documentation that's going to be on the official Microsoft documentation. And that's all hosted on um, GitHub. So you have to have a bit of knowledge about GitHub and Git and understand all of these things and interact with them because that's the world we now unfortunately live in. So if you don't learn some of these technologies, you are unfortunately going to be left behind a little bit. Um, but like I say, you don't have to be experts in them. You just have to know some of the basics and be able to get along and, and do your job basically for it. Now, I'm massively still learning. I'm, like I said, not an expert on a lot of these technologies, but I'm getting there and I'm building up my um, skill set and adding to it all the time. This um, led me to my job at Microsoft. Um, so I actually met someone at the Glasgow Azure user group who worked for Microsoft and thought I would be a good fit for a Microsoft role. And I became a cloud solution architect at Microsoft in I think it was January 2018 um, and I did did that role for quite a while um, I enjoyed that role because it was allowing me to interact with bigger customers, larger scale customers and designing solutions in Azure for them. It was scary at times because these are massive um, companies that you'll all know the names of and I was designing solutions for them in Azure but it was a great step forward and I like I said, the user group has enabled me to do lots of different things. And I met someone who helped me get my dream job at Microsoft. 
However, in October 2019, I got the chance to become a cloud advocate at Microsoft. And this is the role I'm still doing today, where I get to evangelize and talk about the technologies and help the community um, kind of go on the journey that I've went on as well. So I help write blog posts, I help write documentation, I speak at events, I um, create presentations at conferences, I help everything um, around all of that. And it's it's great fun. Um, I think if you told me about five years ago, I wouldn't be a dyed in the wool techie um, doing technology and deploying technology and, and that. Um, I said I would say it wasn't something that was going to happen. Um, but to be honest, I love um, sharing and teaching and helping others on the journey. And it's been great fun, this cloud advocate role. Um, I am still a technologist, though. I'm still earning all of my certifications. I am still going through the exams. I've, I've learned a bunch. So I've got my Azure exams. I think they're actually due to expire, so I need to recertify for them. Um, but I'm still dabbling in other things like the data fundamentals. I've done the AI fundamentals, which, I, to be honest, was actually probably the most funnest. funnest is that even a word? Um, exam that I've done um, and the power platform as well which is a whole other realm that we're having to look into as well nowadays so yeah I'm still doing all of that as well um, as, as doing the kind of cloud advocate evangelism role as well now, as I said, um, user groups are a great way of me keeping up to date with everything that's happening. There's so much happening in the world um, and being able to connect with people who could maybe help you, um, going to these presentations, listening to them, even just listening to the ones that happen at the Glasgow Azure user group really helped me um, keep my skills up to date and again, build up my network so that if I have a question about something, I know that, you know, Gregor knows that something who because he spoke about that at the user group and I can ping him and ask him um, for a cheeky favor to help me explain something. So build up your network, attend these user groups, attend events like this one on Twitch as well, because they will help you build up your network and probably hopefully teach you something that you didn't know before the session. Now, I also use Twitter quite a bit. Um, there's some hashtags that I follow in order to, again, build up my knowledge to keep up to date with everything that's happening. There's a whole plethora of hashtags. These are just the ones that I use um, during my daily work um, to keep me up to date. But again, any suggestions for hashtags that you use or um, know of, like, let me know because um, these are invaluable to trying to um, drown out some of the noise that often happens in Twitter. Um, and you can really focus down on the stuff that you're um, wanting to look at. Now, I use Microsoft Learn for um, a lot of my learning material. Um, my role as a cloud advocate sometimes is to create um, learn, um, you know, documentation and stuff like that and the courses that happen on there, but I also use it to help me train. I used it to help me um, study for the AI fundamentals exam and the Power Platforms um, exam as well. So there's really useful um, information on Microsoft Learn and it's completely free. Now, it also has a sandbox built into it. So if you want to use things like Azure, but you don't want to pay for it, because we don't all always want to pay for um, some of these technologies, um, it has a free sandbox that you can actually use in there. So you can press some buttons, you can deploy some resources as part of the learning modules, and you don't have to pay for it. So you can get that hands-on learning for free as well. Now, another great website um, that I also use um, to have a look at is um, the Azure Heat Map or the Azure Charts website. Um, and what this is, is there's actually a bunch of resources on this, but the bit that I like the most is the heat map. So what you what it does is collect all the news that's been happening um, over the last seven days, 30 days, um, that kind of stuff. And you can distill down what's been happening. So if you've been on holiday for seven days and you come back and you're like, no idea what's been happening, need to catch up with the news. You can go on this website and it'll show you this really cool heat map. And you can see that the, the grids here, so things like um, cost management have just had an update in the last seven days. So you can go and read on that and you can keep up to date with that. So it's a great one to bookmark and there's other resources now as well on it as well. So I think there's a quiz on there and there's stuff about the SLAs and anything that's outages and stuff like that. It's not an official website. It is something that a Microsoft colleague has created, but it's another great resource. So it's definitely one to be bookmarking as well. So certifications, um, there are a lot that are relevant to IT pros. Um, I know contentiously we don't have any Windows Server exams at the moment. Um, it's something our team and I are fighting for, but 
There are some certifications in the Azure realm and Office 365 realm that actually can help you on your IT pro journey. So not all the certifications in Azure are about developers as well. Now, I wanted to include these slides because I often get asked if the on-prem skills translate to what the cloud world looks like nowadays. And I absolutely say yes. Um, you have to understand how these two worlds interconnect because a lot of times companies and organizations are going with a hybrid solution. So having the knowledge of what on-prem looks like and what cloud looks like helps you um, being able to understand the best decision and where you can put potentially workloads for your organization. If you don't have that understanding of both platforms, you may struggle with going forward and kind of picking the best solution for your um, organization. So. Absolutely, still on-prem is still relevant, cloud is still relevant, and being able to mix the two together is very much where I think we're gonna to have to go nowadays. In a, in a hybrid cloud world, there are some things that I think you should be focusing on. Um, automation, big one, like I said earlier on, it enables us to, to away from those um, mundane tasks and actually get to use some of the fun things. Optimization, the way um, we pay for our IT solutions nowadays is changing. So being able to optimize and understand how all of that works and be more efficient with your budget is going to benefit you and your organization greatly. Connectivity, monitoring, security, knowledge. There's a whole spectrum of skills that you need in order to work this hybrid cloud world. So lots to learn, lots to figure out and lots to translate from the on-prem world as well. So that's me tonight. Um, thank you for letting me ramble on about my career talk. Um, there's some resources um, to help you go and learn some of the things that I mentioned um, on screen at the moment. If you go to aka.ms slash career slash talk dot resources. I think that I've, I've totally read that wrong, but hopefully you can see it on the screen. Um, and there's lots of resources there, like I said, to um, learn about some of the things that I've talked about and also some of my contact details as well. Um, so hopefully that's been useful. Um, if you've got any questions, please do let us know and I can happy to take some of those questions. All right, checking the chat here to see what we have. Uh, so I guess for you, if you guys watching, if you have a question you wanna, want us to pass along to Sarah, we'll be happy to do that. Yeah. So Sarah, I have a, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, your, and first, thanks for the presentation. A lot of information there. I'm really excited to follow up with the Azure heat map as just a place to direct people. and like, hey, if you're curious about what's going on, that's yeah. awesome. So thanks, I got something right. out of it. Um, <laughs> I noticed throughout your career, uh, you, you had a pretty solid trajectory. I mean, of course, it looks like a straight line in the presentation. <laughs> um, and we all perfect careers. Yeah. How did you stay motivated at each one of those stages? I think I tried to find something that was going to be fun to learn, if I'm honest. Um, tried to, to break it into little subjects. Like, I know I said I didn't enjoy the IoT or I, I didn't really want to do that project. But do you know what? It was a fun project to actually get in, into and, and focus on. And like I said, I spent a lot of my time, even outside of work, trying to get that solution dialed in because it was fun. Um, it was something completely out of my comfort zone. It was something new to me and I was wanting to overcome it. I'm, a, I'm the type of person that can't leave a project unfinished. I need to, you know, complete that project. Um, so... I think I tried to find things like that just to focus on. And that's probably as well why I started the Glasgow Azure user group to keep my motivation going because uh, I would be, you know, hearing other people and other people would be relying on me to keep that project going. And we've been running the Glasgow Azure user group for over three years now. So um, there's something new every day in IT, right? And I think that's that's the challenge. Um, trying to find something that motivates you um, is, is, is part of it. I think that... Does that answer your question or have I just rambled? <laughs> no, I, I think it's interesting because, uh, you know, your uh, Don Jones famously said, famous or not, is that you own your career, your company owns your job. Um, and I think it's interesting when I when I talk to students about, you know, they, they view any successful career professional is like, well, it must be magical and you do things like that. And I'm like, yeah. I think it mostly boils down to like, renewing yourself and then committing to something again and, and keep that forward momentum. Um, yep. 
So just I always want people to share their stories because it's not a straight line and there are things that happen that are challenging and there are things that happen that go so smoothly that you like, I'll do that again. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, uh, so I also noticed the, about the presentation is that you did a lot of things. And I know from meeting some other cloud ops advocates that it's a very blended position with a lot of different responsibilities. And I know many of us struggle, especially in, in today's world, with uh, how we juggle things and how do we wear so many hats. Do you have any tips on how to stay good at switching hats? Um, it is hard. I'll be honest, it is hard doing that. What I do personally is two things. Um, I block out my calendar in Outlook. So I have um, sections time today, for example, I had like three hours to work on a blog post and then I had a meeting um, and then I had more time to work on a video series that I'm working on. So I blocked out that hour. If I leave my diary empty, what I find is I don't get to the tasks that I I'm supposed to complete by the end of the week. Um, I also color code my diary. So things are all color coded. So it looks it looks like a mess if you were to look at my diary. But it makes sense to me because I can see that the orange things are community events or um, the red ones are internal team meetings that I might not have to miss. Um, I can't skip those. Um, you know, blue ones are team meetings I could maybe skip. Um, so things like that can help um, organize me. I also still do that whole um, writing a to-do list on a, on a notepad, like traditional pen and paper. Um, and I know we have things like to-do and we have lists and stuff like that. And we can have, you know, I can right click on Outlook items and turn it into a to-do item and stuff like that. But that doesn't work for me. It, I forget to look at that, to be honest, or it's an alert I go dismiss and I forget all about it. Whereas if it's on a bit of paper, I can tick it off or I can cross it out. And at the end of the week, I can see where I've, I've, I've achieved something and where I've not achieved something. And then I can start my to-do list for the next week going forward. So for me, that's how I do it. I have to be regimented. Otherwise, I am going to lose hours on Twitter or on Instagram or YouTube watching completely irrelevant things and going down the hole that you go with social media um, often, um, even during my work hours. I hope my boss isn't watching this, but um. Yeah, I regiment my calendar. I have things blocked out. I have um, exercise blocked out. I have lunch blocked out. Um, I have, you know, 5 p.m. Most days I'm like, right, time to get off, blocked out, get out, um, log off and stop working. So for me, that's the two things I do. Organize my calendar and write down to-do lists. And that helps me. Okay. So organization is, is huge and applicable <laughs> to all sorts of jobs. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a really, well, it is a great system. I'm, I'm jealous. I have color coded a calendar events, but I'm not quite to that level. But hey, um, <laughs> how did you get there? I mean, like, was it an epiphany or, you know, was it a charismatic event that you went to? Because, I mean, again, I'm a big OneNote fan because I went to a couple of night sessions uh, Stola Hansen did. And I'm like, this is the best thing ever. And it, it changed a lot of things. But mm -hmm. how did you get there with your organization? Um by not being organized um i was missing deadlines i was stressing myself out i was working till all hours at night trying to match things i was accepting meetings from some of the teammates that work in seattle or australia at weird hours and it just wasn't a great a great solution for me because i was i'm not going to say burning out because i wasn't at that stage i don't think but i was just becoming a bit frazzled and you know, I wasn't having that work-life balance that we all trying to have. So, um, yeah, it was more a mistake that I ended up being organized. It was just something that I ended up doing because, um, yeah, I wasn't doing it right, if I'm honest, at the first when I first joined. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I think that's good to hear because, I mean, we, again, we assume that everybody's got everything locked down and, and things are going, going well. So it's always, thank you for sharing that. So <laughs> appreciate the honesty. Um, and I thought it was really cool how you were motivated enough to start the Glasgow user group. Another thing that I noticed was your discussion about the mentor-mentee relationship that you had at your employer. Um, mm -hmm. How did that start? Was it, you know, I got this challenge or or, or what prompted you to, to have that? Because that's it's really interesting. Um, I think it was just our different skill sets. Um, my colleague was cloud only. Like I said, he'd never touched um, a server. He'd never even, you know, taken a laptop apart to put in RAM or take out the hard drive. Wow. You know, the things that 
for me at least I take for granted um and you might be the same because I know you you do a lot of that obviously in your work so he, I had all these skills um that he didn't have and then he had all these skills about Azure and you know IoT and, and I, AI and stuff I hadn't even heard of to be honest um and we were able to bounce um off each other um and we'd often go to customer meetings and they would be saying oh we have um this issue with our own prem environment you know the exchange server and stuff like that and things that i was like oh yeah i know how to fix that um and we were there to put in like azure solutions or even fix the on-prem environment if i'm honest in some cases um so i was teaching him some things because he didn't understand what that was and he didn't know how to solve it and bits of software i'd heard of he hadn't heard of so it was really just one of those things we unfortunately like uh, fell into I, I'd, I'd love to say it was conscious and we we actually made that decision to mentor each other but it was just something that we we fell into naturally because of our skill sets um but like I said it's definitely something you should try and do in your environment you know um if there's someone who's maybe an older person this is going to sound terrible within the environment who's maybe got a wee bit more experience go and talk to them go and bounce ideas off them and you know hopefully you'll be able to you know learn something from them and they'll be able to learn something from you um because we don't know all i, I know sometimes people think even the cloud advocates know everything but we we don't I, i'm sorry to birth that myth but um yeah we don't so <laughs> Personally, I'm crushed. Uh, so <laughs> I'll, I'll soldier on a little bit. Uh, so uh, this is this is going to be kind of a, a woolly question. So my cloud environment is hybrid. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I I term it public and private cloud. I think that is a good way of talking about that. Um, and I think there's a heavy focus on hybrid, and that's great because I think it, it applies to a lot of customer experiences. It applies to to mine. Mm -hmm. um, if you were going to look through a crystal ball, when do we see the translation between, or the transformation, we'll call it transformation, uh, between you know, on-prem, hybrid, and then cloud only? Is there a, a tipping point where we're going to see, it's no longer, uh, I guess, maybe a little bit dismissed because it says cloud only, because only is a, a bad phrase. Mm -hmm. um, but when is it just, that's what it is? Well, of course you're running that in the cloud. Are we, are we five years out, 10 years out? I probably say we're probably maybe more closer to the 10 years out, to be honest. Okay. Um, I'm hearing lots of stories from colleagues and peers in previous jobs who are still running on-prem environments right now. Even in this current COVID world where we're all trying to work remote and we're all having to make things work so that people can VPN in or dial in or Citrix in or however you want to do it. Some yeah. people are still aren't using the cloud for that um some people are still expanding hardware on-prem um some people are building out citrix environments vdi environments on-prem and not because they have like in you know constraints around where their data needs to live or audit requirements it's mm -hmm. because they haven't had the skills they don't they don't know how to go that fast they don't know how to use it because wow. they're still stuck in um on-prem world unfortunately and that's an unfortunate thing for a lot of organizations because they get stuck in that business as usual cycle of just fixing problems with desktops with the current hardware and they never the staff never get a chance to say like stop i'm not going to do this this week i'm going to go and learn about the cloud i'm going to learn about azure and i'm going to figure this out and try and see where we can get the benefits they're too busy running on that kind of treadmill of fixing what's on-prem and they're getting left behind unfortunately um so yeah i think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done within not only it but i think businesses culturally you know and um, the people that make the decisions the business owners need to think a bit more about it because it's often the thing that gets left behind right they see it as an expenditure and they don't see it as something that is worthwhile within their, env their environment it doesn't have any return on investment you know your sales department your marketing department you know you can spend money in those departments and actually get a return you can see where your money's been spent often people think you just spend money on IT and there's no benefit to it at all. But as IT professionals, we know that there's a massive benefit. And if there's, you know, if IT wasn't there, they wouldn't be able to do half the things that they needed to do. So I think there's a lot of cultural change that still needs to happen outside of the IT department before we even get to a cloud only world, um, if I'm if I'm being honest. 
Uh, so 10 years. Uh, we'll get there. Uh, so one of the other things is that you, were, you started to talk a little bit about culture, which is one of my favorite things. Um, how do you build relationships? Uh, that's for Josh King. Uh, how do you build relationships with people on your team when you are remote like this? Uh, is it, do you like book time or, or, or what's your, what's your secret, Sarah? I'm not sure I've got this one dialed down right because I have a team who are based in Scotland, Switzerland, Australia, Canada, East Coast of America and West Coast, right? So those time zones do not overlap in any shape or form um, no. often. So, um, yeah, my colleague and I in Switzerland, Thomas Moore, actually do have a one-to-one -one every week. Now, that's really easy for us because there's a, only a one-hour difference. So it's, it's super easy to schedule. And um, Thomas and I have been having those chats. And we actually had our chat today. Um, and we spent half an hour talking about Ubiquity, network equipment, and Philips Hue lights. So <laughs> we didn't even speak about work, if I'm honest. So those kind of relationships are great. Um, and... I've got to the stage where I, I don't even put on like my makeup, I don't do my hair, I don't put on my contact lenses because I'm that comfortable with Thomas now, which sounds really weird. But, um, you know, we, we are in that total um, teammate zone. And I think you need to have those kind of times um, with your teammates that are remote who don't live in the same, you know, um, house as you <laughs> nowadays because that's where we're all based. Um but I don't, I, I, I need to make a better effort with the people who are outside of my time zone. But it's, and not to make excuses, but it's often hard, especially with, say, my Australian colleagues, because as I'm getting my breakfast in the morning, they are just logging off, ready to get their dinner and, and, and do things like that. So you really do have to make a conscious effort. And I think we all need to get better at that in this world. And especially since... There are cultural differences. Um, we were speaking actually just before um, this live stream about some of the cultural differences and some of the ways, even just, I've been doing a lot of gardening, um, which is, you know, tending to my backyard for people who don't talk the lingo. Um, and, and things like that, those, those things make a difference in having to translate some words um, into different phrases and understand that um, you know you have to build that you have to work on that you have to understand that um, certain people love to see things visually some people only want to interact via email that's just the way they, they want to work some people want to have those face-to-face -face calls every week and you have to have those face-to-face -face calls um, but everybody works differently and I think we all need to make a massive effort to work with a team that's remote and I yeah, I, I'm not great at it, but I try my best when I, when I can. <laughs> I, I think it's probably a lot like your calendar where being deliberate goes a long way. Uh, and again, I, I find that being intentional and just saying, hey, this is what I'm trying to do makes it a lot easier to have those conversations. Because um, yep. I know a lot of us in this current environment didn't ever plan to work remotely. Um, and it's interesting because we didn't broadly build up those skills. And so it's always interesting to talk to people who have been practicing to a degree. You know, I have friends who work remote all the time and they have mm -hmm. tips. And, you know, when the rest of us were really, you know, scrambling to get webcams and, you know, move our stuff from our offices, it's like, oh, well, welcome to my world. Um, <laughs> so I think it's interesting that there's a whole aspect of being deliberate that, that goes a long way. Um, yeah. So. In your presentation, you mentioned working for a whiskey company, and I gotta ask, like, how what? I mean, that's one of those, you know, some people's dream job. And hopefully, watching the stream, how was that? I mean, other than the barn that was really chilly, which probably saved on cooling, uh, how was how was that? I mean, how did you leave that? Um, that was a cool company to work for. Um, one of the the perks for working for a whiskey company here in Scotland is um, you sometimes get an allocation of um, alcohol. So every quarter you would get to go and pick so many bottles um, of, of the produce and get to do that. So that was fun. That was an experiment. I joined the company not liking whiskey, left the company addicted to whiskey. Um, so, um, yeah, that was fun. And getting to see how it was made and getting to hear some of the stories, because that's that's a great thing as well as IT, because it takes you outside of your department. You know, I get to interact with the people who you know are in the canteen in the restaurant 
the people who are HR, the people who make the whiskey, even the person that owns the company, I had to deal with him um, on occasion. So you get the chance to build up relationships outside of the IT department and and just learn a bit about that. So the whiskey company was good fun. Um, unfortunately, I left because there was no role. My career, I you know, there was no role above me to to move into. Nobody else was moving on. They weren't expanding. So in order to further my career, I had to leave, unfortunately. So, um, but yeah. It, it was good fun. I, I I do miss some of the perks of working for a whiskey company. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We don't have any whiskey companies in Washington that I know of quite yet, so I'll have to, to hold my hopes out for that. Um, I've got two. I got two right down the road. Three ooh. of them, actually. I'm sorry, three. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Live 45 minutes from the Jack Daniels Distillery. Okay. Cool. Come live near James. They have distillery. <laughs> Tempting to stay on the West Coast, though. Uh, so I think, yeah, okay. So I think it's interesting throughout your whole thing is like, be deliberate. If I was going to cliff notes for the for the people I'm going to talk to in the future, be <laughs> deliberate. Yep. Reach out, be genuine. Uh, and and throughout the whole thing is like, you've definitely acknowledged that you need to keep moving your career up and recognizing when you hit um, a barrier or a ceiling. Mm-hmm. Probably not the best word, but um, and I think that's that's awesome and commendable. Um, all of us should take cliff notes on that. Um, is there anything else that you want to share? Because again, I want to be conscientious of everybody's uh, time and, and mm-hmm. how that goes. Um, one thing I probably haven't I didn't talk about in the presentation was um, try thing new things. So for a while, I um, del- to say was like I'm not going to start a YouTube channel I'm going to start a YouTube channel I'm not going to start a YouTube no one's going to watch that what am I going to talk about finally Uh did it and I've been doing that now for 60 weeks so I do a weekly blog every Friday talking about the Azure news and I talk about what I'm doing and just share some of this, this the stuff and the nonsense that I talk about every week and I've been doing that for 60 weeks now solid so every week I've had a video and although I'm not hitting you know the Kardashians type viewing figures or whatever it may be. Um, I've, got a, I've got a steady following and it's actually helped me do things like this, talking to the camera. It helped me build up that skill. It helped teach me about audio. That's why I've got this Rode microphone to try and help improve the audio. That's why I've got these audio panels. These aren't just art panels. These are oh. audio panels. So they help um, dampen the sound. They also look great in the background. So it taught me tons um, that I didn't think I needed to know or wasn't important. And to be honest, I wish I'd started it before that I did. I finally did. So don't be afraid to try these new things. Don't be afraid to go and write a blog post. Don't be afraid to go and create a YouTube video. You don't have to be on camera. You know, it could be a screencast and you're just sharing how to do things. Just try these things because you never know what you're going to learn from it. You never know what opportunities are going to come from it. And you never know how you're going to surprise yourself and how you actually do these things. So um, don't be frightened because the majority of the community are massively supportive. And that's what I've always found. And yeah, just go out and try it. There's, you know, fail, fail fast, as they say. <laughs> fail fast, try again. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and I, I love subscribing to your YouTube videos. They're great. And, you know, it's like my travel log of Scotland plus Azure. So two things that I'm fairly <laughs> interested in. So thanks for that. Um, when did you, so you've done it for 60 weeks and I, I, I saw the video where you did your, yay. Um, <laughs> when did you feel that it became a successful habit? Because that's another thing that folks are curious about. I was like, well, if I start a habit, you know, flossing my teeth or doing a YouTube video, uh, when do you feel that it, it crosses that threshold from, something that you're working actively on to being just, oh yeah, I'm today's today's YouTube day or maybe mm. a couple of days. Some weeks are harder. Some weeks it's definitely yeah. I have to force myself to keep up that cadence and that habit. Other weeks I'm super excited and I can't wait to do my video and you'll probably see some of the videos where I'm really talking really fast and I'm really excited about stuff. Um, and those are the weeks that I, I enjoy and keep me motivated. Yes, there's always going to be weeks where you you, you may struggle with it like like flossing your teeth right we probably all don't do that enough as our dentists all tell us um but um yeah I think if you have a passion for these kind of things it'll come naturally um and even on the weeks I struggle I still do it because I still love seeing the reaction from the people and it sounds very it sounds very like 
weird that I like seeing people like it or comment or share it and you know that doesn't drive me obviously but it's nice to see and it keeps me motivated and it keeps reminding me to keep doing it and not stop um if that's what I'm saying to say it's nice to see so yeah like I said the community are amazing in supporting these kind of things so I always remember the nice people that are nice to me and I reciprocate that to other people as well and, and encourage new people that start new channels and stuff like that so yeah if the world goes round in good karma that's why i think <laughs> we'll, look around good karma. we'll keep that in mind uh so another question i have um how many individual places did you did, were you employed at before you landed at microsoft and even at microsoft you've had two or three positions two at microsoft um, two at microsoft okay i don't, I don't know I'm going to have to like pull up my LinkedIn profile or something to like figure out this one. John, check my LinkedIn. Don't ask questions on stream. <laughs> no, like, because it's a few, because it's definitely not as little as I maybe talked about on, because um, like you said, it sounds like a linear journey that all just went very smoothly and very nicely. Didn't, that's, you know, that's not quite how it worked. It um, never worked. <laughs> um, there's definitely a few jobs in between that I probably regret choosing because I, I chose for the wrong reasons um mm -hmm. but let's 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 see how many jobs I actually had now do you want companies or do you want jobs with even within the well I mean I think that's another important point is that <laughs> like <laughs> and, and perhaps perhaps too granular you know it's like one of those bi dashboards <laughs> that the pivot table pops open and you're like whoa I did not expect that amount of information <laughs> but for example is like I'll talk to people in the community and they've been at their current employer for I don't know, 10, 15 years, but they've gone through a number of role changes and folks will get hung up um, when I talk to them about, well, I've been at my current company for X number of years. I'm like, well, you haven't been doing the same thing. Yeah. I think I think both are valid because you could switch companies because you want to reinvent yourself or, or take a different whole career path like coding, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and infrastructure as code, which double thumbs up. Um, position changes do you think helped you along your career? Um, so I've just counted on my LinkedIn. So I had eight okay. different companies and IT roles okay. um, before I got to Microsoft. Um, there was a lot of job changes in between there because some of the companies I was there for, you know, five or six years and changed roles and got promotions and stuff like that. Um, thinking about it, actually, my career probably has been quite linear in the sense of what I was talking about in the presentation. You know, I started off doing those first level help desk roles. I moved up to second mm -hmm. level, third level and consultancy. And then for about probably the five, six years, I've been at that consultant level um, or architect mm -hmm. level. So I'm a big believer in doing that kind of apprenticeship within the IT department. I I see some people come straight out of university and go into an architecture role and start to design massive systems and they don't understand, you know, how a naming convention really works in the real world or how some of these solutions actually work and how they interact with the end users. So um, I'm a big believer in people have to kind of start at the bottom, unfortunately, and go through all the pain that you need to go through. So I think all my job roles taught me something, whether that be about technology and enhance my skills or about how to not actually pick a job and how to change a job. Because like I said, I've changed roles sometimes chasing the money and that wasn't the right thing to do. So um, there's definitely, every job has probably taught me something, um, either about myself, technology, or about the whole changing job process that you should really actually go through in your life. So yeah. Um, I, I'm yeah I don't I don't regret any of my job choices to be honest but yeah like I say some of them I know I've checked I've thinking back I've chose them wrong um so but but that's that's life isn't it it's about making mistakes and learning from them and not um letting letting them get you down that is a very fair and articulated response so <laughs> I, I appreciate that I because again <clears throat> excuse me it's important for people to understand that nothing is linear and that it takes dedication and a little bit of, well, a lot of it being deliberate uh, mm -hmm. to make career moves and career changes. And I think it's important for people to both internally and, and externally in the communities to understand that that journey is is normal. Um, I, I think it's great in your example of how you started at the help desk and worked your way up because I think that's an experience that a lot of people have. Um, 
I don't know how consistent it is with you know, folks younger than, than the present company, um, because I don't know, we, we often joke, I feel that we want a junior sysadmin with five years experience. Well, those two things, like, no, it's not how it, it rolls. It should be a junior sysadmin with, do you know how to install Linux from an ISO? Do you know what an ISO is? Don't forget um, the master's degree. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, obviously that's what it requires. Um, <laughs> So I think, you know, part of the thing that, that I, I find in, in a lot of roles is that you have to inform people in hiring and, and what have you that the folks that you have internally, they're there because they're already to a degree a cultural fit, which yeah. means if they're still willing to learn, you've already solved the, the hairier and woolier part of a person being hired. I do hiring, so I think about this stuff a lot. Um, but I think it's important for that to be communicated that, yes, it's it is semi-linear it's good to know the company it's good to know your motivations even you mentioned it's like sometimes i chased a job for money and that maybe wasn't the right thing um and i think that's those are all factors that need to be talked about because you know usually it's like well i want to go work for a big giant multinational corporation because they have a really good medical plan and maybe the job isn't what you know fills my bucket uh, yeah. bucket filling is very important um <laughs> So I, I think that's that's really good. So thanks for for sharing that. Um, nice. Yeah. Well, at least right. I refer to like a very. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, Sarah, we definitely appreciate you taking the time out, time out of your day. Thank As you me. said, it's six o'clock or seven seven o'clock now, probably seven p.m. Yeah. yeah. Uh, over there. So we appreciate you ta uh, taking the time to talk to us a little bit. So this recording will be posted on YouTube uh, in a couple of days. Uh, but just kind of give everyone a heads up of some of our uh, our next.